If you've been listening to this podcast long enough, you've probably heard me say that a music career is full of ups and downs. In this episode, we're going to talk about those down moments as a special Halloween edition. We're going to talk about musician horror stories. So here we go. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY Musician Podcast. Welcome to episode number 319 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, where on today's episode, we're going to talk about musician horror stories, and we're going to hear some of your horror stories that you sent into the show. It's going to be so much fun. My name is Kevin Bruner, and joining me is Chris Robley. And Chris, I realized I just said that listening to artist horror stories is going to be so much fun. <laughs> well, everyone knows that you're right. You are correct. You know, I, I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed, though, that you didn't start this intro with like a very sp- in a very spooky edition of the DIY <laughs> Musician Podcast. In a world where a musician's <laughs> career is hard. <laughs> yeah, we, we should uh, have... Uh, I don't know, uh, howling wolf sounds in the background and stuff, but yes, I'm excited. Uh, maybe, I'm actually... maybe that can be added in in the post production. <laughs> yeah, well, people who are watching the YouTube version of this might notice I'm in a different place. I'm I'm visiting my mom uh, in Rhode Island. How sweet of you! <laughs> home of my first 18 Halloweens. So wow. wow, I'm in I'm in the spirit. I'm in the same place. However, after we record this. I'm pretty excited because I'm going to the airport to get on a plane for Lisbon, Portugal to go to the Womex conference and then jumping over to London where we're doing a DIY musician tour stop event. By the time you hear this, the event will have happened already, uh, most likely. Uh, But yeah, it's fun to, I haven't been out of the country since 2019, so I'm excited and trying make to remember sure, how that works. <laughs> yeah, make sure you pack your like 14 different electrical adapters for yep. Europe because they can't seem to all agree on anything. Um, what yes. else do you need? To, yeah. And, Speaking of Womex, though, say hello to the folks in Winborne. They will be there. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes. Yes, I will be looking for them and hopefully they'll stop by the CD Baby booth. And uh, we're also speaking. We've got a panel, a few of us from our downtown parent company, from our different companies are going to be speaking on a panel about royalties and all that. So it should be fun. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this episode. When when we started talking about it, uh, we were thinking about humorous stories. You know, those things that happen that really just in the moment, they really suck when you're, you know, at a show or in the studio or this or that. But when you look back, it's kind of humorous. At least some of them are, not all yeah. of them. But then we started, I started thinking, man, there's so many horror stories artists have told us over the years. And I started really lumping them in groups. And I, we came up with a list of eight. Uh, so we're going to get to that soon. We've got those horror stories. Then, uh, and we're going to talk about how to avoid them. And then Chris and I are going to share some of our anecdotes from our music career, things that didn't go as planned. (laughs) (laughs) And then we put out a call for uh, your stories on the socials, and we got some great stories back. So it's going to be a great episode, and I hope you enjoy it and you learn some things, but also... It's always good to feel like, okay, I'm not alone. This has happened to other people. <laughs> well, and la- laughing along to the pain is appropriate because I think Mark Twain used to say that um, humor relied on heartache plus time. So once a sufficient amount of time has gone by and the embarrassment has faded and that sense of failure, <laughs> it's just funny. So let's all laugh at our yeah. horror well, stories. Well, usually for me, I'm the kind of person that's laughing about it while it happens because it, wow. I don't know. You, you, you're ahead of head of the game, then. Well, I just I just kind of go through life like it's a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's ridiculous. I might as well just laugh at it. Um, speaking of socials, if you're not following us on socials, follow at CD Baby on all the platforms because you might get asked to contribute. But you can also follow myself and Chris. I'm at K Bruner on Instagram and TikTok, and Chris is at Chris Robley on those same platforms. And sometimes we put out a lot of personal uh, messages to 
to get your feedback for the show. And we always just like connecting with artists. In fact, a lot of the interactions I have with artists on Instagram and TikTok and in other social platforms uh, are inspiration for a lot of these episodes. And this episode is definitely one because so many artists reach out to us over the, the years with uh, these stories. And so, yes. And lastly, uh, at CD Baby, distribution is still $4.99. So if you've got a song or an album, you need to get out there. Do it right away. I hear that's coming to an end soon. I don't have a specific date yet, but go to cdbaby.com, sign up your single, your album. Even if it's not ready yet, you can go ahead and lock in that price. And uh, that includes a barcode and all our monetization options, everything it's except pro in. publishing, which is an additional charge, but that's uh, uh, drastically discounted right now as well. So head on over to cdbaby.com, get that new music signed up, get ready for your new releases before that price disappears. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's probably good to remind people whenever we have a deal like this, I'm pretty sure whenever we do it, you're always able to buy in bulk for future releases. So if yep. you're like, ooh, four ninety nine is great, but I don't have that much music ready, you can buy submissions now at that price uh, and then save them for later. So when your uh, singles or albums are finished, you can then sign them up then. Although in this case, I'm pretty sure you do have to select the format right away, right? So you know, maybe you buy five singles and two albums or whatever you're sort of projecting yeah. to do. Yeah, you can go get yourself set up for the next season of your releases. So yeah, cdbaby.com, head over there, check it out. All right, and lastly, before we dive into our list, I will put out our phone number and email address. If you want to contribute a horror story, we don't just have to have it on this episode. We love these kind of stories. Uh, it's Halloween year round. It's Halloween year round when you're in the music business. <laughs> so... You can call our listener line at 360-524-2209, or you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. And you're more than welcome to record your message at home on your own recording gear. Just try to keep your message to about three minutes or less. So that's all we ask. And we've had some people send those in. The audio quality is usually better. And that way you can edit and not have the fear of the voicemail box running out. All right, Chris, uh, we've got eight on the list. I'm sure we've missed some things of our artist horror stories, things that artists have told us over the years or come to us like frustrated and angry or that that has happened. And they're in no particular order, by the way. So let's just dive in. Uh, <laughs> spooky. All right. The, the first up, uh, the first artist horror story that is a common one is when artists have signed a terrible contract. <laughs> I'm providing real time sound effects. Today. There you go. I, I should have pulled it out. I have a copy of the original recording contract that small town poets si signed. And I think I referenced it one time when I was speaking a, a, that it was its own horror show. And uh, yeah, so I think obviously when you're in the music business, as your career progresses and you're doing deals or whether it's a label or a management deal or a booking agent uh, deal, there's going to be contracts involved. And so many times and so many uh, stories of frustration and anger and feeling like their career uh, derailed that I've heard from artists have to do with signing a bad contract. Why do they do that? What leads to this? Uh, is it that legal language in these contracts is just intimidating and hard to parse out? Or is it that they are they have stars in their eyes and they think they're going to be made, you know, everything will become easy and they'll be instant stars? What's the... In my opinion all? is that, that artists just want to feel some validation with a professional working relationship. And so they jump into something without doing the due diligence of like, what does this actually mean? What am I on the hook for? What, what are they going to require of me? So with these horror stories, what we're going to do is give some advice on how to avoid um, it turning out to be a horror story. So first off, 
get a professional to review any contract you have. And it should be a music business professional because the other piece, and this may be the one where it actually turns into the worst horror story, is I've heard so many stories of artists saying, well, my dad's friend is a real estate lawyer and he read the contract and said it was fine. Oh, he a real estate know lawyer does not is. know yeah, know <laughs> anything about the music business necessarily. So yes, get, get a professional to review the contract. At minimum, read it yourself slowly and with thought and consideration because oftentimes I think artists just sign these things without reading it. If there's things you don't understand, drop it into Google. There's probably some references online somewhere with a contract that will help you understand what's being asked. And Chris, we even have a, a list of like some free legal services available on our website. Yeah, if you go to the DIY Musician blog and in the search bar type in something like music law or a lawyer or something like that, there'll be a an article that'll have a list of these organizations where um, attorneys volunteer their time basically to help out artists and, and people who have like intellectual property law questions related to the arts because they know you're musicians. You don't have, you know, $2,000 an hour to have someone look at a contract. So they do give of their time to help out. So check those out. Yeah. So avoid the, the legal contract horror experience. Read it. Get some advice. Take a few minutes to do your due diligence. All right. The second we have on our list, this one, I, this one angers me. And this when is, I hear artists, this one's so terrifying that I'm pretty sure we recorded an entire episode around this particular horror story, didn't we? Like a year or two ago? I think we did. And this is the one where the producer or engineer claims to own the music or a portion thereof. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is something that that we hear so much about. I'm just shocked that – I'm always shocked that uh, – maybe I shouldn't be – that it exists or it happens or – because, yeah, I don't know. At least my experience with the music business – I mean, I went to school in Nashville and studied music business. And, you know, of course, they're going to always look at it through the traditional music business and – the studio was its own entity and the label and everything was so expensive back then that the label obviously was paying for the studio time and all that. But as the industry has progressed and recordings gotten cheaper and, you know, producer engineers wearing multiple hats, this is a common problem where people go to a studio and somehow the engine, I don't, I just don't even understand how the producer engineer or whoever it is just assumes that the music they're helping you record is somehow partly theirs. Well, and there's a couple ways that takes shape. And to clarify, it is not this scenario where you go, you work with a producer or engineer, and they don't release the tracks to you until you've paid them. That is perfectly normal. Like yeah. if they're working, you know, for 20 hours or 40 hours and you haven't paid them yet, and you're like, hey, man, can, can I take my hard drive home or can you send me the files? Or they'll be like, uh, no, pay me. And then I, that's fine. What will have the, the two scenarios we're talking about is where they take creative ownership of the music outside yes. of what you want to do. So you leave the studio. Now suddenly you come back and there's like a string section where you wanted like hip hop beats or there's all the, they've replaced your lead vocal, you know, just whatever it is. And you're like, wait, what the hell are you doing? This is my music. Um, that's one problematic thing. And then the other would be where they take sort of legal ownership and they try to distribute it on their own without cutting you in on, the ability to control it, you know, yes. what, where, and when the music is shared and, and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, have these conversations ahead of time to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. And for clarity producer, that, that term gets used very differently at times. It used to historically just mean almost like the director on a film that the producer is the one that's, that's bringing all the creative talent together and kind of guiding it to make sure that the outcome is good. Uh, now, a producer could be someone that makes a track. And therefore, yes, you may have some ownership claim and some stake. That's 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 um, also another scenario that you should be aware of. But the bottom line is to avoid having some sort of horror story around this, get service agreements in place. At minimum, have an email that says, this is how things are going to happen. We're going to record at the end of the, at the end of 
the recording and you've been paid in full, I'm going to walk away with the files. Make sure that you talk through that. You don't need an, you know, an email that has those things listed out and they say, yes, that is correct. Should, should be fine. Getting a, a service agreement like a contract could be helpful, but just really just trying to provide that clarity so you know at the end of everything you, you've done and you've paid that you're going to have your music and it's yours to own and keep because there's some nefarious people out there doing some funny things around that. Yeah. All right. The next one we have is a career misalignment between your manager or your label or your booking agent. Just this relationship where you thought it was going to be one thing and then in their mind, you're on the hook for something completely different. <laughs> this one um yeah i think this one you get set up for uh how do i say this you, you sort of enter some these agreements with um big dreams for what they will accomplish for you and then it becomes something else and you realize i think you even said this like you end up working for them instead of them working for you that's sort of how it starts to feel yes and i've experienced this firsthand and it can be frustrating and it it doesn't necessarily happen with people having nefarious intentions at all that's one thing that's important i think that's why a lot of artists it just builds to a point where they feel like it's uh, their own horror story and that their careers turn into that it's because all those people work off of various types of commission or earnings that are based on you working as an artist so if you're burnt out if you need to take a break or it's too much they make less money. And if you don't have those things, those honest conversations, you can suddenly feel like you're uh, the hamster on the hamster wheel running so everyone else can benefit while your mental health or your financial health, everything's falling apart around you. Yeah. Um, not that I would know anything about any of that. <laughs> <laughs> you man, you managed to salvage some things along the way. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. I, I went out to dinner one night. This was probably, I don't know, 12 years ago or something with um, a person we know in common who I can't remember if he was considering taking me on as a management, like he was going to either be my manager or a booking agent or both because he certainly was doing both at the time. But we went out, we talked for a long time and basically said like, I'm happy to take you on and, and work hard for you, but I can't do that unless you're going to play, I forget, like 175 shows a year. And I was like, oh, my God, what? Really? And I was so glad. I was shocked and a little disappointed that he said it in the one way because I was like, it's not realistic. I can't do that the way my life is. So I'm going to lose this opportunity to have this guy work, you know, together with me. But I was also very happy he said it to just lay that expectation. He's like, in this economy, when I'm working for bands, I know that I'm not profitable and I can't make them profitable unless they're committed to you know, minimum 175 days on the road. So what did that? Yeah. An example yeah. of what, what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and those conversations can be frustrating or disappointing, like you're saying, but better to find out up in advance and not burn that relationship than to say yes. And then not be able to follow through or, or really stress your life out and your, you know, and, and ultimately burn that bridge because if you're honest and, and like in your situation where you're saying that's not where I'm at right now, maybe in the future you will be and you still have that relationship mm -hmm. intact and they didn't have a bad experience with you as an artist. But I've seen that happen a lot uh, where artists put themselves in situations and yeah, suddenly they feel like their career is not their own anymore. It's somebody <laughs> else's to make them money. Yeah, and I know we'll mention some band dynamic stuff, collaborator dynamic things later, but this sort of misalignment can also happen internally with groups. It's like people kind of aren't on the same page about what they're willing to commit. So we'll probably return to something like that. But yeah. Uh, all right. The next one, this one's heartbreaking. Uh, and I hear artists tell some various, uh, you know, stories, some to various degrees of around this exact same thing but spend a lot of money recording or uh, doing a project and hate the outcome. <laughs> and I say doing a project because I've heard this with like music videos and things as well. So it's not just like necessarily the music, but 
really invest a lot of money in something, usually the album, and hate the outcome. That's just devastating. And we and we're not talking about the way in which we all hate our own music, you know, when you're oh, I'm sick of this, whatever. Like where you're like truly wrecked because you're like, I don't even want to put this out. I feel so embarrassed or it's so not representative of what I was trying to achieve. And oh my God, now I feel like I have to because I spent whatever, $10,000 on it or 2000 yeah. whatever it is. You almost said the exact scenario of my friend, uh, Melody, uh, she spent, I think it was 10 grand. And the whole time the recording was happening, I was talking to her and she was saying things like, this isn't what I want. He's the producer's not listening to me. I hate how this sounds. This is not me at all. Uh, it's super yeah. pop and polished and that's not what I want. And I'm embarrassed to even put this out. And it was her first album. And uh. And it was one of those things where it's out there, but she doesn't promote it because it truly is not what she wanted at all. And it's it's just heartbreaking. I'm laughing because the lesson is clearly don't ever spend money on anything. <laughs> just <laughs> DIY Jesus everything. Right. And then you won't right. be, then if it's a total failure, you can be like, eh, I'll scrap it. I didn't put any money into it. Yeah. No, it's it's hard. And that, that one also kind of ties back into a little bit of number two. We said like the producer engineer claims to own the music. But I think also in that process, when you're working with other creative people, it's hard because doing due diligence uh, can be challenging around engineers and recording uh, these days for a couple of reasons. One, it's hard to find credits these days. So it's like, oh, it's hard to know what other music potentially they've worked on unless they tell you, which they should. But um, but it's also hard to understand their creative process. So even if you've heard music that they've done and it sounded good, you can be in a situation where you just hate the process and the, the outcome. You just don't like it. And it, it's that's frustrating. That's probably one of the bigger horror stories because then you felt like you spent so much money and now you have nothing to show for it, at least that you feel good about. Because at the end of the day, as artists, we're the ones that have to go out and sell this thing. And it's not even just like sell it, like asking people to listen and buy it. It's like, it's a representation of us, of our career, of what we think where we're at at that moment. And if yeah, that's it's a, just a big miss, it hurts. Yeah, and I could see uh, like differences in process and comfort. You know, artists feeling like they're in the zone in certain settings might uh, create some problems. Like maybe you love this producer you've lined up to work with and all the music they've made is amazing. But then you get in the studio and you realize they're like, no, you only get two takes. That's where the magic is. But your whole life, you're used to like multi-tracking vocals and auto-tuning and fix, you know, and suddenly you're, you're feeling exposed and vulnerable. Your confidence goes down. And now working with this person who is a pro and has made music you love is detrimental so i know when you work with people of a certain caliber it's tough to like say hey why don't we do like a day or two together and see how it goes because they're busy you want to like nail it down for whatever a, a longer duration but probably is advisable if you can to just do like a small project and just see yeah yeah exactly and it and this can be the case with very established well-known names uh for our first record we were recording in Memphis, Tennessee at Ardent Studios, and our producer was John Hampton. He had produced the Gin Blossoms records that were, you know, multi, multi platinum and all over the radio. And we started recording with him and he his vibe was amazing. He was like so he was, you know, someone that's like it's more about the feel. It's more about. You know, it was just a great match for us. It was going along great. He was sick for a handful of days. It was like two days, I think. And uh, they brought in another producer who has produced some mega, mega hits uh, that I'll, I'll, he'll remain nameless, but he's produced <laughs> some big, big albums. And so we thought, okay, he'll come in and he's just subbing in for a couple of days. And it was while we were doing guitars. And I hated working with him, hated it. Mm. He was the exact opposite. And I thought I could never do a record with this person. 
he was somebody that would just like grab the guitar out of my hands and just start recording it himself. It's just that all that, like, it was so different than what we had been doing for like the two and a half weeks to leading up to that point. It was so jarring. Mm. And uh, yeah, so it can be that, you know, just trying to find out their creative process, how they work, um, even if they've done good stuff, because uh, their process might not jive with what you're doing and you can walk away feeling like that was not a good experience, which even if the outcome was okay, the fact that you had a terrible experience kind of, I don't know, kills any momentum for wanting to go back and record more music. <laughs> yeah, it hurts your self-esteem probably as a player, and now the band's yeah. got some weird vibe. Yeah. Yeah, if, yeah. All right. So, yeah, do some due diligence. And, you know, also spending a lot of money and hating the outcome, you might also want to make sure that when you're working with people, maybe – Talk to some other people to make sure the rate that you're paying is in line with what you're getting. That's something else that's that's worthwhile and to avoid some of these horror stories. All right. Um, we've got a the next one. We've got a, an email about later on, so we won't spend too much time on. But hard drive crashes and you lose everything. <laughs> I was talking about this episode or a couple days ago with my wife and she was like, that doesn't happen. That's oh, that. Yes, that one's fake. I was like. No, no, no. You would be shocked how often this happens. Yes. Yes. So we've got an email about that later on. So we'll talk about it a little bit more. But the, the main thing to avoid this, back things up. At the end of the day, it, at the end of the day, make sure that the studio or the engineer, if you're recording at home, just have two hard drives at least and just make them mirror each other and copy everything. So you have a second copy. Um and also make sure you understand the studio's hard drive policy because another thing is that you may have recorded it. It's all on their hard drive and you're like, oh, I'll come back and bring my external hard drive and get it later. They may clear that drive out. Um, mm -hmm. I know one studio we were at, it was like after a month or two, they would clear it. They'd delete it because they've got all these other projects coming through. They don't have infinite hard drives to store everything, nor do they care. Once they've provided the services for you, they may not care that they don't have your files anymore. So yeah. make sure you understand that and back things up. Uh, one of our uh, producers used to say that if it didn't exist in three places, it doesn't exist. It's a good, which one. is a good way to think about it. All right. So moving on, this is another heartbreaker horror story. And I've heard it almost from every single artist is that their trailer gets stolen or a large amount of gear gets stolen, but I've heard it related to the trailer so many times. Um, and that's heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, so I should knock on wood now since this is, I don't think that's ever happened to me. You've had uh, gear stolen though. Have I? You, you talked about at the being parked at the Doug Fern, them smashing your window. Oh no, no, it wasn't my, no, no. I just know that that happens all the time. Oh, the okay. I, I was thinking that no, you that's... had gear stolen there. No, I was just, feeling bad for slash laughing at other musician friends oh, which is funny because i was at a restaurant just a couple weeks ago that was across the street from the doug fur and i parked right next to the doug fur and there was a pile of glass from a smashed window there <laughs> of course I there almost, was <laughs> i almost texted you because it was like with a picture because i just thought we were just talking about this yeah no, I've, I I don't th I should probably even stop saying this because I'll be cursing myself. But yeah, I don't think I've had gear stolen, but um, definitely knew quite a few bands whose whose vans would get taken. So they started doing that thing where they'd back the van up right to their hotel door. And uh, so if people tried to steal anything, they couldn't even like access it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I mentioned trailers specifically because I've heard this happen so much with trailers. And so. One, get insurance, uh, Music Pro Insurance, check them out. It's really affordable. And that's something that your homeowner insurance doesn't cover. A lot of people think it does. It doesn't. If you're using your music gear professionally and taking it out of the house to do gigs, your homeowner insurance will not cover it. But take pictures of your gear, get serial numbers. I know it's a pain, but it helps. Um, I had a a uh, friend that had a, a, a $5,000 acoustic guitar stolen recently. Ooh. And the, the world we're in now is that it's actually hard to unload these things. And um, he tried to, the person tried to go to the pawn shop and the pawn shop, you know, knew that it was probably stolen. 
they checked the serial numbers with the police department. The person was found and arrested uh, within a few days and the guitar was returned. Um, mm. The fascinating thing is insurance paid him out really fast and he got another one <laughs> and the insurance company was fine. Keep them both. Oh, so, that's nice. <laughs> so it kind Bank of error in your favor. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, take pictures, get serial numbers because uh, it is kind of hard with all the websites now and things. It's easy for to spot stolen gear on Craigslist and, and places like that. But mind your trailer. This is the one thing that's really easy. It's so much easier than people realize. If you're in a parking lot and you don't do something to, you know, to kind of block in your trailer, it's easy to just cut the, the lock off, pick it up, put it on another truck and drive away. And that's what happens a lot. Mm -hmm. So avoid that. That's, that's one of those heartbreaking ones where I see bands out on tour and their trailer gets stolen. And it's like, not only did you lose all your gear, but your tour just came to an abrupt halt. Yeah. I remember, um, I forget. I think it was the, the, the December, some, you know, successful band was out and got a bunch of stuff stolen. And then they were like piecing together friends, giving them instruments to like make yeah. up their entire arsenal. I was like, Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Just about everybody. I know that it it's happened to, it didn't happen to our trailer, but I've had gear stolen from my apartment, which uh, was, was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, several guitars. Uh, all right. The next one. And this, this is probably where a lot of the band horror stories come from. Personnel conflict. And I think there's, there's a lot of things that are sources of personnel conflict. You know, some people are just not nice people. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a lot of it comes from not having clear band agreements in place, roles and responsibilities, um, clear contracts for studio musicians and understanding like, hey, who is the core owners of the band? Who are people that are just there to enhance touring or are brought in for when the budget allows for a larger group on stage? Just a lot of that stuff, if you're not clear, can really cause a lot of conflict and problems. Yeah. So I think it's worth remembering too, like just like any long-term relationship or marriage, like even if you get along so well and you like agree on almost everything, you'll still inevitably annoy each other, find something, you know, it's every long-term relationship has difficulties that have to be worked through. So I feel like the more you kind of expect that and can be proactive about communicating things, even like when I was touring, like we had to have a conversation at some point of like, okay, we all like each other, but from like three o'clock to about five 30 every day, we don't want to see each other. So that's our time to like all <laughs> splinter off and to do our own thing, whatever that is. Yeah. And, and just having that little bit of space by the time we came back, we felt like a team again. Uh, so I don't know that just, um, recognizing yeah, it, that it's not always, you know, interpersonal nightmares. Sometimes it's just interpersonal fatigue of having to go at something for four weeks in a row and, yeah, when when you're uh, when you're on the road and you're it doesn't even matter if you have a tour bus, if you're in a van or a tour bus, it's like you're still living on top of each other and everything gets annoying real fast. So it's those things where you have to have those honest conversations like you were saying, hey, from this time, let's not be together, you know, mm -hmm. or let's block this out and understand that um, uh, I'm going to need some alone time. Or, you know what? Yeah, yeah, just some of those things. I, the longest tour we did was 90 cities. Um, and one That's of the, a lot. it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of cities. <laughs> and we watched the, the, we were the opening, opening act and the, the middle act, uh, they had some players on the road with them, which all they did was play. That was it. You know, they weren't the, the the artists on the record. They were just in the band live. And we watched them slowly go crazy <laughs> over the course of that tour because they were bored. They were, uh, you know, they wanted to play more and their, their set was just a half hour. And it's like you spend so much of your time on the road doing anything but music. And 
so it's weird to watch when people get out on the road and it's like Groundhog Day, the same day over and over again, what happens. And so a lot of it, a lot of those horror stories and conflict can happen from just not realizing that that may not be the lifestyle for you, um, <laughs> which is what one of those guys realized. <laughs> <laughs> After on his 90th show he went home forever <laughs> it got pretty pretty crazy <laughs> just like the uh the the lunacy of like these guys are melting down <laughs> there's some, there's some... <laughs> i don't think well, they're gonna make it yeah it's uh think about the scenarios that artists and musicians we put ourselves in like going going into the studio it's a very different challenge from the road it's more, much more stationary, but even then it's like, you're living like a vampire for like days at a time. If you're working that way, if you, you know, like, and suddenly it's like, wow, we've been, we've had headphones on from noon until 11 PM. No one's eaten. We're all cranky. It's like lots of the things that artists do bring out, could bring out the worst in us, even just yeah. from our emotional investment in the project and how it's being received. All of it could just turn us into little demons so I, I i whenever i like i go i've been on tour it, it always feels like it's this weird like managing this low level malaise of like <laughs> I'm from, i don't feel completely human but i'm not dead and somewhere i gotta manage the day-to-day -day in there and still do shows <laughs> my the bass player you know arthur that plays bass yeah with me. yeah he describes it all as just you know the word ennui he uses that word for like everything for touring for the studio. It's only it's like, uh, yeah, now I'm going to do a terrible definition of it, but it's that sort of malaise just sinking into the blah. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it doesn't matter what your travel situation is sitting in a vehicle for five, six, seven hours a day. Isn't fun. No matter yeah. if it's a plush seat or the back seat of an SUV, it's not yeah. fun. I just had one last thing to say about personnel conflict, which tied back to like the kind of not being on the same page about business agreements and stuff, which is I've been in projects where everyone kind of starts with the assumption that you're all on the same page. You have yep, the same yep. goals. You want to put the same amount of sacrifice into it. And then you, when the work takes hold, someone gets cold feet and is like, Oh, I didn't imagine I'd be rehearsing this much or I don't want to be on the road that much. It kind of what you, all these problems, but it, it, it takes a while. It takes the struggle for them to reach that conclusion and recognize it in themselves. And then even sometimes when they reach the conclusion, they haven't been super vocal about it to everyone else there. So then everyone else is like, wait, do you want to be here? Don't you want to be, I don't know. It just creates all this extra uh, unspoken tension and, no, that that's the exact scenario I was going to mention before we moved on. I, I was talking to an artist here in Portland and uh, it's a band, but um, the lead singer, she also did solo stuff, but the band was really great. I went out to one of their shows and I'm like, why aren't you playing more? And she was talking about she was going to go lead, the, uh, you know, sing with this other group for a while. I'm like, but you guys are amazing. And it's like, well. The drummer, he he kind of does all our business stuff and he kind of sees it as his thing to some degree and he doesn't want to play any more shows. He says he can't. I'm like, well, why does he get to decide? I mean, mm. in those those kind of things. And so it's driving a lot of conflict, just not being on the same page about what you're trying to accomplish. I think how you described it is everyone assumes everyone's all in, but then it's work. It starts to mm -hmm. feel like a job. It takes up time and effort. And uh, yeah, it. And, and the get, ways get on the same page and, and the ways in which people might retreat from that all in could all look different. One person might not want to play shows. Another person might not want to do something else. So everyone's yeah. Get on the same well, page. Well, especially I think part of it, what happens is that instead of somebody just honestly saying, Hey, I love being in this band, but I can only do this. Is that acceptable? Instead of just being clear and saying that they start to look, I think it, sometimes it can start to look like, self-destructive a bit or like they're just being uh difficult about every decision or every show opportunity like what is your problem just tell me what your problem is <laughs> and what they really are trying to express is that they can't 
commit as much, but they don't want to say it because they don't want to let people down. But now they're just being a jerk. So if they simply you know. said, I need Thursday night for family date night kind of thing, Thursdays are out. All the problems would be solved. Yep. If people could just say what they mean, the world would be. I don't know if it'd be a better place, but it would be less, <laughs> less angry people, maybe. I don't know. All right. Uh, the last one we had here on the list as a, 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 a category of horror stories we hear all the time is someone dealing with bad press. And, and this one can be, can be pretty devastating at times. And I think part of it, the devastation is not as much about the, the impact of the bad press, but more of the fact that it's so hard to get press and you have to do a lot of work to get to that point. And when it happens, if it sucks, you just feel like the whole world thinks you suck. Yeah, probably long-term listeners have heard me say this story a lot, but I, my first band when I moved to Portland, Oregon, just got this awful review, and I was convinced that everyone in town would just like see me pass by and be like, oh, shame, shame, shame. <laughs> like I felt like a pariah, and like no one would want to be seen with me. And yeah, it's Scarlet totally Letter. Yeah, it took a huge toll on me for, you know, weeks. I was didn't want to go out. Um, and then the other part of the story people are probably sick of hearing me say is the first person I saw at the first time I left the house to go to a venue, <laughs> they said, I saw that review, man. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm like confirming my You're fears. Like, it's true. It's, it's true. true. But yeah, th that was like a, not a mental health toll, but like a, just a self-esteem confidence kind of thing but then these scenarios can lead to like huge flame outs or whatever the term would be where like if you get retaliatory like we you and i have seen so many bands just be like talking shit back and arguing with the reviewer about why they're wrong and i'm like stop <laughs> it like yes your fans can do that sometimes and that's fun or funny but the artists themselves making a counter argument just looks so insecure and kind of pathetic. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. If you get bad press, number one, stay away from the internet or at least posting about it because you're literally arguing with the press who can then just make things worse for you. <laughs> so, so don't do that. Don't throw gasoline on the fire and cause an explosion. Um, yeah, there was, I, I, you're probably thinking about the same instance. There was a big one here in the Portland area where this band just went and flamed out big time and everyone watched it happen. It was oh, digging their grave deeper and deeper. It was so terrible. So terrible. So one, when you get bad press, eventually, I mean, if you're, if you've got a career and things are happening, eventually you're going to get a bad review you're going to get, uh, whether it's about a show or your album or your release or just your career in general, somebody's going to say something that just um, makes it, you know, that, that could be hurtful. Um, don't retaliate. But after you take a deep breath, I think you can turn these things in, in social media. Now, I think the fun thing is you can turn these into like almost like a fun thing that you can involve your fans in and not, not to go, you know, don't sick your fans on any review or anything like that. You don't do that. Uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't Jimmy Kimmel do us? Is it him? Someone, some late night person has a series where they read mean tweets about themselves or something like that. I think, yeah, I've heard of. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you can make it fun. Like, and, and it could be a fun content piece where you're just like, well, I guess I can't please everybody or something, you know, <laughs> I don't know, but just don't make matters worse. It will happen. Um, I know when we first got one, I was like, where's this person's address? I'm going to go find <laughs> them. We had like 20 amazing reviews in this one person that one reviewer is like, it wasn't even that terrible, but it just, you know, I'm like, <laughs> who is this person? How dare Where they give me they? a mediocre review? Where are they? Because clearly they don't know music. And what's wrong with them? Who gave them this job? <laughs> don't do well, that. Well, I have one uh, story uh, to share on the positive side of this. So there's a person that I respect a lot who's a songwriter who got, they made a great album. It got completely skewered by 
someone uh, by a critic and you know, it hurt. Uh, and they kept put, <laughs> putting out music and they're following two or three releases for some reason, just for that exact same critic, just really it worked for them. And that critic is now like a huge admirer of the artist. And I think they're even sort of personal friends now. So it's like, it's not always the case that someone who hates your music will always hate it. Um, as long as you don't burn the bridge and <laughs> go to their house, like Kevin was yeah. saying, they could actually become one of your biggest fans and supporters down the road, which is in this case is sort of what happened. Yeah. You know, it, I think it is okay. You know, give it a little bit of space, but I think it is okay to contact the reviewer or if, if it's an article about you, whoever wrote it and, and you know, give it some space. But then contact them and say, hey, I'd, I'd love to take you to coffee and just kind of understand your perspective a little bit or or understand or or, you know, we we're, we're trying to learn and grow and get better. And I'd, I'd just be curious to hear more about your impression of us. I think that's how you can win somebody over and how they can give you a second look. And, and sometimes you might find out they're like, yeah, I was a little harsh and I was having a bad day. I just got in a car wreck and <laughs> you're like, well, <laughs> thanks a lot for taking it out on us. But. But anyway, there are ways to turn that into a positive, like you said. So just don't make a bad review or bad press even worse by <laughs> uh, making drama online. Well, Chris, that was the, the main buckets of horror stories that that we had that we've that I had was thinking about. It had thought over the years, I hear all these things like they all fall in these buckets. I'm sure we missed some. So, uh, yeah, if you have something that you want to contribute if we miss something or you just have a personal story you want to share feel free to do so uh we had a couple that we were going to share um chris i don't if you want to go first uh, yeah and, and and actually i wish these were very very specific like you know sort of narrative of a particular <laughs> thing but they're more minor specific <laughs> all right so I'll, I'll go my mine are a little more general like i think the most common horror story type of horror story I experienced was live mishaps. And so this would be like some of the stuff we probably talked about in our touring episode, but like your gear breaks, you know, you're on, you're a thousand miles from home and this effects pedal, you really need to get this particular sound just breaks and none of the stores have it nearby or you're uh, playing an outdoor show and you really need to see the led readout, but you're under direct sunlight and now you can't see your damn effects patches. Like, oh, that's those the worst. Um, worst. And then like that thing where like you feel like you have momentum going in your career and then you show up in some town and you end up like playing for the bartender and like four other people. And you're like, I'm beyond this. I should. Wh why is no one here? Or someone in the band gets sick while you're on the road and you're like, do we do the show without them? And now you're like on the fly doing a set that feels sort of naked and incomplete or just playing a bad show you know like everyone has a bad show once in a while and and i think those were the things that happened not all the time i <laughs> make it sound like we're a terrible live band but uh <laughs> when you play enough these things happen enough. oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah it's you, waiting yeah. around like the, the one i always tell about that place in california where the guy made us wait till 1 a.m before he gave us our drink tickets like just places like that I'm like who are these people why am i here what am i doing with my life that that's why i felt like um radiohead did this is an old documentary that they did called meeting people is easy if, if it's movie. available somewhere online i highly recommend it when i first got it i thought it was going to be like a concert film i think it came out in like 2003 2004 somewhere around then i thought it was going to be like a tour documentary concert film it, it, and it, the first time I watched it, I was just like, huh, I don't understand what I just watched. It is a tour documentary. Yes. For yes. Sure. But when I went back and watched it again, I realized, oh, my gosh, this is the most brilliant thing ever. <laughs> now that I understand, it's not about the show from the excitement of the fan perspective. And me as a viewer at home watching their concert, 
it's what it feels like to be on the road because you see everything but the show. Literally, like I think one of the only show show clips they have is from standing out on the street when someone opens the door and you can kind of see the stage. Yeah, inside. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and every time they show a little snippet of a live moment, you're like, ooh, good. And then they cut it off. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, yeah. And I'm yeah. like, this is the same thing over and over again. It kind of hit me. I'm like, this is exactly what it's like to be on tour. So yeah, it's like when you get on the road just stuff has started you you experience a whole different <laughs> life just change you're in a different uh i don't know it just feels like what is going on <laughs> it's just, uh -huh. nothing is ever perfect but my oh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead well, no, i was gonna I was tell gonna... a couple of my stories but you finished oh i just had one more thing to say you mentioned uh, sort of personnel conflict i honestly if i'm being super honest i think the scariest thing about my whole life in music has been confronting my own personal shit, you know, baggage that we all have as people and like wishing that I'd done a better job earlier on and showing gratitude for the people who made music with me, uh, being better, being a more proactive communicator, being more direct because some of those sort of unspoken tensions and, and band drama um, certainly happened because other people brought that, but I was bringing it too. And it was like, yeah. So that weird way in which sometimes we're our own worst enemies. Like I was trying to tie this back to Halloween and I thought of myself as this weird Frankenstein monster of like the top half of me is this like, uh, I don't know, super egotistical, like I'm great. I'm so good. And then like the, all the other parts of me are like really insecure. Like I'm not any good at all. And someone stitched me together and I'm like walking around, like, I don't know, constantly, never fully in one place of feeling like either very confident or very not confident. I'm always at war yeah. with myself. Anyways, that's the scariest thing for me is soldiering through and learning lessons, I guess. Yeah. And it's hard when, especially if you're an artist like yourself, where you have band members that come with you, but it's your thing. Um, it's hard. Or even you're in a band with people that they are a part of the band, but there's different levels of investment. Mm -hmm. It's hard when you're the one that feels like this is, this all falls on my shoulders, the the risk and the reward potentially. And you can get in a mode that can be pretty challenging to work with. I mean, I I, I tend to be that person as well, where I'm like <clears throat> trying to be like, no, put on a happy face. We got to go out there and play this show <laughs> and we're going to get some great video. And, you know, <laughs> and uh, and the and taskmaster. So, yeah. 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 It, it can. And so it can it can drive some feelings from other folks as well. So it's, it's important to express gratitude. It's important to remember that, uh, you know, that kind of lifestyle is challenging, especially for certain personality types um, yeah. who like to know where everything is and have their day planned out. Um, and who there's who need to, well, I shouldn't say need who prefer to have a lot of control over their environment. Yes. And like, as a musician, like it's so much of it is about having no control and trying to just make some, calm amidst the chaos <laughs> that's what i love about it <laughs> i know me too <laughs> i would literally wake up every day going i have no idea what's gonna happen today i, think I don't I'm even play where, a show where I am i know. yeah what? that's the... <laughs> man touring before uh everyone had smartphones was the best you would roll out of the bus literally going into the gas station and asking them Hey, what city am I in? <laughs> They'd look at you like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I have no idea where I'm at. You know, <laughs> I think I'm in Texas. It may be Oklahoma. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. So I have a couple stories. I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to keep them quick, but I was thinking about like a couple of like, they, these are very specific horror stories. So we had this touring bus uh, that was like, a converted shuttle bus. So it was smaller. It was about 30 feet long. It was still a big thing. It had a bunk room, a living room, but it had a van front. So you didn't have to have a commercial license to drive it. And we needed a place to park it. Um, we lost wherever we were parking it before. We couldn't park it there anymore. And so we got this storage place, you know, where you park RVs and stuff. And uh, we were all meeting up at this storage place at midnight uh, to drive all night. We were going to uh, this gigantic festival. It's the biggest festival in our genre. It was called Creation East. It was about 80 to 100,000 people there. You know, picture it as like 
going to Coachella or something like that. But this was in the, the 90s. And uh, we had like a prime slot like at 6 p.m. in the afternoon, in the evening. So, you know, a really nice slot. There'd be lots and lots of people there. We get to this storage facility, thinking we're just going to get on the bus, drive, and have lots of time to slide into Pennsylvania, where we were in Atlanta, Georgia. And if you're familiar with geography, that's a long ways, probably a 10-hour drive, maybe. Um, so uh, we get there, and we can't get into the storage facility. And then we find out that someone actually lives on top of the storage facility. They're like cussing us out the window, <laughs> telling us they're going to call the cops. And we're like, oh, crap, what did we do? We can't get our bus out. And they were just screaming and yelling. And finally, we got them calmed down. And like, you can't get your bus out of here until 6 a.m. when this thing opens. We're like, oh, man, how are we even going to make this gig? So finally, we come back 6 a.m. We're just busting our butts up to Pennsylvania. Fortunately, everything goes well when we get there. And we're just so flustered that like we pull in right at our sound check time. And you get 20 minutes. We pull up. They unload what we thought was our gear. And we realized our road guys took our merch up to the merch tent and they took half our gear with them. So we're oh on stage God. and we're on stage and the stage manager is in the microphone berating us, like yelling us, what are you guys, some sort of beginners? This is your first time ever playing a gig? And he's literally saying that right next to our lead singer <laughs> when he opens his backpack to get out his cables and he drop pull you know dumps out the cables and they are literally in this massive knot of all the cables <laughs> are in knots and i'm just standing there going like just kill me now just please <laughs> please this can't get any worse <laughs> and, and so we're just scrambling fortunately we got all our gear back to the stage and on time but we were so flustered and it was like our biggest slot on one of these festivals ever to date and it was just all going wrong. Fortunately, the the actual show went well, um, but we were not in in a good headspace. But when he was on the microphone, because he was in the mo monitors, it wasn't out in the house, but it was in the monitors. And he just for like five ten minutes, he's just making fun of us and oh, yelling at us, and it, and I'm just all jittery. That's making it even worse. So that was one of them. The the other one that was a really <laughs> low point in my career was. We did this event. There was this big outdoor event at an amusement park. You know, a lot of amusement parks have outdoor amphitheaters. And I think this one held like three or 4,000 people. It was this big youth event. And we had done it the year before. And it was amazing. And the stage looked great. And they had us playing with another band that was very popular at the time. And uh, so they had us back the following year. Well, they thought they would cut some costs. <laughs> uh, they just had us. It was almost 100 degrees out. We were playing at like 3 p.m. or 5 p.m., something where it's like nobody wants to be at a show. So there was hardly anybody there. They thought they'd cut all the costs and not have any lights and very minimal sound. And so there was this massive bare stage, like insanely huge, with just this little drum kit, my guitar amp, and our bass amp, and that was it. You know, it looked ridiculous. <laughs> and so stupid. Nobody's there. It's, it's 100 degrees. And we're like, this is terrible. And we go out to play and they introduce us and the drummer counts off and I come in for the first song. There's nothing else but me. And I start playing and nothing's, nothing's happening. And I'm like, oh, crap. So I'm looking down at my pedal board. What's going on? What's wrong? And the lead singer comes over and plugs something in. I'm like, oh, we fixed it. So he counts it off again. We didn't fix it. I tried. Nothing happens. I go over to my pedal board. And I started the song, so my guitar is cranked in the mains. Oh, no. I go over to my pedal board. I'm trying to figure something out. All of a sudden, all you hear is this. It's just everybody's just looking at me. I'm like, this. I thought, I thought being in a rock band was supposed to be cool. And it was just horrifying. The whole thing was horrifying because all my gear was falling apart. That was part of the problem. I, all my gear was falling apart. I was too broke to fix it all. And anyway, it was one of those where I'm like, ah, I should have been a banker. <laughs> yep. Playing, playing music is either the most glorious or humiliating endeavor. <laughs> yeah. You're just standing in front of these people. There was probably, you know, four or 500 people 
but they all look like, you know, they're all sweaty. They're all like, they didn't look very excited to be there. And, and then, then the that's scene, what you gave them. We The stage already looked ridiculous. And then our, our introduction to it <laughs> seemed even worse. And yeah, I, there's, those are, I had a lot of those moments where you're like, this is, this is, I thought being in a band would be kind of cool. This feels like public humiliation. That's a good one. And look, we're laughing. Yes. Afterwards, it took a couple of days for me to laugh about that one because that the whole thing just looked ridiculous. And, and it was so loud. People outside of the, the, uh, the theater area, because it was an outdoor Yampa theater, people outside of it could hear like the crazy guitar squeals and sounds because the sound man had just cranked it. You know, I think he thought there might have been a problem on his end. So we just cranked it really loud. Oh. Yeah. Yep. That's that's one of those things. Whenever you have shows like that, it's like, I just need a good show to just wipe away the sins of all these bad <laughs> shows. Please can I just have one good show, like good in show. the mix every 10 shows. So it, <laughs> there's some redeeming value to all of this. <laughs> and then that's what you coast on for the next 10. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because you can go. Remember that one show? We actually rocked. People we were good. Us. That we one time good. we were good. We were good. Something worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have uh, some calls and some emails of your horror stories. So let's let's get into those. Let's start with a call from from Josh. Uh, this is his horror story. Kevin, Chris, Josh here from Australia. Now, this story is probably not going to sound like it's possible and like I've made it up, but I promise it's 100 percent real. We had a drummer back in 2007 in the band that I was in, and he kind of had this mentor who was an older guy. It was a bit of a weird relationship. He kind of took this young guy that was drumming for us under his wing and took care of him. So we just kind of tolerated because of lack of drummers in the region, some of the weird behavior that the two of them would elicit, particularly at gigs. Long story short, there was a point where our then bass player's father purchased a new truck and gave our drummer the impression that his family had money. What we didn't know was that between our drummer and his mentor, they were desperate for money. So later that week, and no word of a lie, they imprisoned our bass player in a unit or an apartment, if you're in the US, locked the door, wouldn't let him out, and grilled him about how he needed to find the money to keep it a secret that he couldn't tell anyone and he had to front all of this cash and that he had to go to his father, who clearly has money because he just financed a truck, and get all this cash and give it to them, then they eventually let him out. Then our bass player came back to the house where we were all living, woke me up, told me the story, and was obviously experiencing a massive amount of trauma. And the kicker was it was a health-related thing going on with this older guy. So when they arrested him, he actually had to go into care, and he ended up escaping from the hospital. And I think he was on the run for three weeks. So wild. And our drummer turned up the very next day to the pub and tried to act normal in front of the singer and myself, not knowing that we already knew. So that's my music horror story. Righto. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Wow. That's that's a horror story, all right. <laughs> this sounds like an episode of Fargo or something like that. Some yeah, I like, show. I like how he showed up trying to... Trying to... Pretend like nothing had happened. <laughs> like, and then the old guy escaping from the hospital. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it's amazing. That would be a good episode of... Uh, someone should do... I don't know. I, could, could there be like a, a Netflix miniseries of like... Strange stories from the road. <laughs> or so, I don't know. Something that's like... <laughs> yeah. See That, that was a bass, good one. Bass players and drummers, they all get, the, get a bad rap. Uh, maybe for good reason. Um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna read read one. All right. Uh, hello. This is one of. Oh, here we go. Hello. This is. <laughs> I keep reading it wrong. <laughs> hello. This one is more of an awkward moment than a horror story, but it was certainly inappropriate on a local news broadcast hosted by a guy who went to elementary school with my wife of 22 years. I was asked whom I'd written the love song for. The host claimed to be a very close friend to my wife. He's not, and assumed the song was written for someone other than my wife. The song, 
the story begins is about a lot of people. It isn't truly a love song and songs often don't work in literal ways, but the dude was just trying to cause trouble. Watch me squirm. He sent a video to the link. I, I think, uh, and it's from, uh, from Mark, the person that sent it in, his name's Mark. I watched the video and I, I can see where Mark is feeling like, oh, this is, I'm on the news, I'm being interviewed and it feels like it's going off the rails. Mark, I, I feel like the host was just trying to be folksy and have some sort of connection. And he seemed awkward, like he didn't know how to handle it. But uh, yeah, it was it was one of those like situations where you're on you're on live television and you're like, this is a great opportunity. And then it feels like this isn't going the way I want it to be going. Oh, you know what? This is reminding me of some of my horror stories. I won't be too specific, but like that exact moment where you're being interviewed on air or for some magazine. And then you're like, wait, this is what you're asking me. Like my chance to actually talk about anything else besides this stupid shit you're asking me about. That's so. Yeah. I feel, I feel for that. If the interview is going in a, just a weird place. When we started doing a lot of press, it got to a point we decided if they ask us again what kind of cereal we would be or would want that we're we're, we're out of here. Okay. <laughs> that's just like <laughs> let's let's have some quality journalism here. Let's not ask stupid questions. Or like if they're like, What kind of cereal would you be? You'd say, Well, we put the album out in March and then yeah. like just carry on with whatever you wanted to say. Uh yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that was amazing about that radiohead. Uh, meeting people is easy because they keep showing the press ask these same dumb questions over and over again. They weren't asking them the serial thing, but and you could see that they're just like, I'm so over this. I'm so <laughs> over this. We've answered this a thousand times. Can't somebody think of something more interesting? So, uh, all right. Here's an a, here's a email from a different Mark. Um, this is Mark from Seattle. Uh I have endless stories. I hope you like this one. Bebop and Destruction drummer quits. 1996. Bebop and Destruction, I think is the name of the group. The band had made two records and we finally scored a really nice gig at the Jazz Alley for the Earshot Jazz Yearly Awards. We were to play a short set, then awards, then a jam session. Easy enough. We finished the first set. The music went fine. And during the break, the guitar player went to the bar and had five shots of Maker's Mark whiskey doubles <laughs> i wouldn't be able to walk back up to the stage if that was me that would not happen <laughs> drunk out of his mind we started the jam session and everything was fine until the guitar player started comping on the piano i'd never seen him play piano and he was not even playing the same song i turned to him and i'm like bro what are you doing our drummer is super angry and we somehow managed to finish the song the set is over and people are mingling around the guitar player falls off the stage and cuts his head <laughs> Not terribly, but it looked bad. So he sits down in a booth next to the mom of the bass player and kind of passes out. Meanwhile, our drummer is super angry and quits the band right there. That drummer, that drummer John Wicks, drummer of Fits and the Tantrums. <laughs> uh, so he, he kind of laughed. By the way, we are all still friends. Kind regards from Seattle. Maybe he was angry because he was playing <laughs> jazz instead of what instead he ended up of, doing. Yeah. Wow, and also, uh, you guys probably shouldn't have let the guitar player fall asleep after he'd hit his head. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I guess he lived, so it's all right. Oh, that reminds me of a horror story that... Uh, I'm in a, I was in a band called Hello Morning here in Portland, and our guitar, other guitar player got a little out of control, and we caught it on video of him during our last song Picking his guitar up, swinging it, because he's just like having this freak out and smacking, like smacking hardcore our lead singer on the head. And I didn't see it happen. And we walk off the stage and the, the green room, the lights are out. And I hear Henry say, dude, turn on the lights. And I turn on the lights and it's all <laughs> bloody down his face. He had a giant gash in his head and we had to take him to the hospital. The it's video. all on video. Search Hello Morning. Uh on YouTube, you will see it. Hell if I remember co correctly in the video, you like show the, the moment when the guitar hits, but then it like happens a few more times. <laughs> yes. You repeated it. Oh. Yes. 
And the ironic thing, the other guitar player was an EMT and he did not help. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's some sign of some band drama and some, some things not going well. <laughs> ah, let him die. <clears throat> yes. All right. We've got uh, another call. Let's get to it. Hey, Kevin and Chris. This is Malia, and I have a story that I wanted to submit to your worst musician horror story segment of the podcast. So here it is. I'm a classical pianist, so I'm coming from the classical world, which itself is already scary because the performing style is pretty conservative. <laughs> it can be stuffy. We tend to take ourselves too seriously. But a couple things happened to me on stage once that were kind of funny. I was not laughing at the time, but I can look back and laugh now. So that's what I'm going to share. And I call this affectionately my spinal tap moment. But instead of getting lost backstage like they did in the movie, I sort of got lost on stage. So this happened in 2009, Monterey, California, and I was the featured pianist for Beethoven's Choral Fantasy, and that particular piece has full orchestra and full choir. The venue that we were at is just kind of a typical size stage, but with this particular piece, there were so many people that had to be packed onto that stage. Full orchestra, full choir, not to mention the nine-foot concert grand that took up a third of the stage itself. So I was waiting backstage and by the time it was time for me to come out and take my bow, I was coming from the very back of the stage and there was no obvious pathway. In fact, there was no pathway. I didn't know how to get from the back of the stage to the front of the stage. And so what I had to do was sort of meander through all of these people. <laughs> so I meandered through starting with the sopranos and altos, and then uh, I passed by the contrabass section, and then I passed through the horns, and I'm passing through the woodwinds, and I'm kind of like people are moving their stands so I can get around them, uh, scooting their chairs <laughs> so I can walk around. I finally made my way to the string section and finally got to the front of the stage. By the time I got to the front of the stage, the clapping had totally died down and typically the featured artist will take a bow before the orchestra is tuned. So I bowed, but I bowed to silence. And then when people realized that I was bowing, some of the audience members started clapping again. So I, I got a few pity claps. I'll call them pity claps. <laughs> so that kind of flustered me. That whole situation kind of flustered me. And then I turned around and realized that the bench, the piano bench was completely pushed underneath the keyboard part of the piano. And that's um, that's unusual. Usually a stagehand will place where that bench is supposed to go. So I had to pull that bench out myself. And when I did that, it just, the legs made these huge, <laughs> this really loud screeching sound on the on the floor. And uh, so I made this <laughs> awkward sound. And, and so I, I tried lifting the bench and it's one of these big, huge Beethoven benches. And when I lifted it up, I didn't realize that when I set it down, I set it down on my gown. And so it, sort of trapped me and I couldn't stand up. So after trying to stand up, realizing that the bench was was on my gown, uh, I kind of yanked my gown out from under the bench and I was finally able to stand up. I don't think I ripped my gown, but I might have. I, I don't know. I can't remember, but I was finally able to stand up and I could hear the chuckling from the audience. I I think that overall it lightened the mood. I think it was all kind of a good thing. The performance went on, it was fine. I got a standing O, <laughs> but as somebody who really suffers from stage fright, this was scary, but I can finally laugh about it, I don't know, 12 years later. <laughs> Uh, so that's it. That's the story. And I just wanted to say thank you guys for creating this amazing podcast. I love it so much. I've been listening since uh, 2018. 
And actually, I'm finally planning on releasing music in the next few months. And if anybody's interested uh, in watching that journey, you can find me at Music Theory Shop on Instagram. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks for that call, Malia. Man, classical gigs are terrifying. Stressful. All, all the people I know who have the worst stage fright are all classical artists. That's Can't like be an worst. accident. Probably my worst stage fright incident, which I won't go into detail here, uh, was I had to take classical guitar in college and it had to do with the recital that I was doing there. And man, those things, rock and roll, at least you can jump around and <laughs> pretend like <laughs> get some energy out. <laughs> and, it, and in fact, it's supposed to always sound just like a little bit bad. If yeah, it's like, like good, then you can't trust it. Yeah, like something's about to go wrong. That's probably when you're like right in the groove. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, uh, that's a, a great description of just that labyrinth of people and chairs and robes and to, to, to get through to get to the front of the stage. It's funny. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, having to negotiate that, especially in that environment where it's people are just sitting there staring at you. Not like, you know, if you're playing a club, like they'll just start chit chatting or drinking or whatever, and it's cool. All right, we've got one, one more, one more email, and uh, this is from Miles, Kevin, and Chris. I still get anxiety thinking about this night. I have my recording studio in my basement, and a few years ago, I purchased some upgrades in the form of microphones, room treatment, and an interface. A couple of acquaintances that I had performed with before heard about this and asked if they could come over and record their quartet. We talked for several weeks about how we would set up the studio and the songs they wanted to record. I was pretty excited to record them and was looking, looking forward to the session. The day of, I spent a good deal of time cleaning and setting up the room, making sure I had refreshments available and setting up my sessions. and in uh, his, his DAW, about 15 minutes before they, their arrival, I restarted my PC because it seemed to be running a little slow. A grinding sound came from my PC tower, and I was treated to a blue screen stating that my PC had encountered a problem and asked if I would like to repair my hard drive. My heart sank all the way to my ankles as I clicked yes, and the repair process started. Just then, my doorbell rang. I ran upstairs to meet my first guest, and he could tell I was flustered. I told him my PC was having some issues, but that hopefully it would be okay. I should have just canceled and told them that we would have to schedule another time after I repaired my PC, but I was determined to record them after all our prep. While leading him down to the basement, I grabbed my slower laptop that I hadn't turned on in months, praying I wouldn't have to plug everything into it. However, when we got to the basement, the hard drive repair attempt had failed and my PC was dead. So I made it worse as I desperately tried to integrate my laptop into my interface and monitors as the rest of the quartet showed up, each in turn slowly acquiring a concerned look on their face while I updated drivers and adjusted settings. They warmed up and I scrambled. My ability to record went from four channels to two. I had to quick uh, build a session from scratch in an older version of my DAW. However, I finally had a session up and running. Take one went well. Take two began skipping and cracking, and I just hung my head. The two guys I didn't know were looking at the other two guys I did know with a, what have you got us into face? And I swear I saw a silent, I'm sorry, mouth from, one con <laughs> from my main contact. <laughs> Finally, one of them said, maybe we should try and come back another time. There were cordial formalities exchanged, and I was left in my basement alone with some untouched snacks, drinks, and my paperweight of a computer thinking, that maybe being a banker the rest of my life wasn't the worst thing. <laughs> the good news is that after a new SSD hard drive and a reassuring conversation, they did come back and eventually were happy with my work. However, thinking about that night still makes me break out into a little bit of a cold sweat. Thanks for all you guys do. May your hard drive never crash. And if you want to check out a functioning studios recording, uh, the functioning studios recording, just search for Miles Morgan and all the things uh, on all the things or check out my website, milesmorganmusic.com. That sounds very in keeping with um, just whatever that unwritten rule of music is that when you don't do something every day and you're like, oh, today I'll do that thing. It'll break. Yeah. It always happens with me. Like, oh, I'll take that synth out that I haven't played in six months for this little recording. Oh, it doesn't work. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things that like computers and technology are becoming more integrated into, especially the live performance that man, that, that is always frustrating. Like we'll do multiple gigs in a row, perfectly fine. Sound check, perfectly fine. We go up to do the gig and the computer that has the click and some tracks and the guide track just randomly isn't working. You're like, what on earth happened between two hours ago when everything Nothing was perfectly has fine? It's, it didn't even leave the stage. It just sat there. Nothing. It sat there, plugged in, didn't lose power. Everything was fine. And now it just doesn't work. It's just, it's just, it drives you crazy. So uh, we got to a point where, you know, having the sessions installed on a backup computer has uh, helped someone in a, in a pinch. But one time it was just that the computer stopped recognizing the interface. And it's like, we restarted, we did everything. It's like, nope, the interface isn't there. It's like nothing changed. But yeah, the, the computer crashing... That's always a tough one. Yeah, don't re wouldn't recommend doing any co major computer maintenance right before. Right before. But he was it just is restarting, thinking it's running slow. I should just restart, and that that seems normal. But then there is a grinding noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, restarting the hard drive. That sounds like something that would take five hours. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we thank you all for contributing. It was short notice when we put this out on the CD Baby socials and our own personal socials. And uh, we got some great stories. If you have a music horror story, we accept them year round, not just right before Halloween. So you can submit those by calling our listener line at 360-524-2209. Or you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. And you might just find yourself on the show. I uh, just had one to add. Escape the Paradigm wrote a little horror story on oh, Facebook yes. and said they were in Texas. They had nine hours to go to their next gig. In the middle of the desert, the tire of their trailer popped. Mm. So that is the worst. Yeah, that is the worst. <laughs> that reminds me. Actually, this is a good one. From <laughs> I totally forgot this one, uh, but. This this was uh, that that story reminded me that bus that we had, like I mentioned, it had a van front, so you didn't have to have a commercial license to drive it. So on long tours, we would hire a driver. But when we were doing like weekends, long weekends and stuff, we would potentially be driving ourselves. So I was taking a shift from midnight to 3 a.m. driving. And I should say we bought this bus new, but in the course of two years, we put 164,000 miles on it. So it 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 got it's uh, it got a lot of road use and abuse. My shift was ending. I'm in the middle of West Virginia somewhere, just pulled off at a gas station, and my shift's over, and everybody's asleep on the bus. Nobody's awake. I close the door and I'm going out to start pumping gas. And I go out there and all the wires connecting to the trailer are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, ah, and, and it looked like it was going up the, the, the wires. It looked like going up into the generator area because the generator was in the back right by where the trailer. So it looked like the wires were on fire up into the generator. And I run over to the side door and I open up. I said, the bus is on fire. <laughs> And everybody comes piling out in their underwear. Our road manager's like hopping around trying to get his pants on. And then we realized we, we had a fire extinguisher or something and put it out and realized it was just the wires got overheated and, and you know, no serious damage, but we're going to have to get some new wires that connect the trailer. And the whole time we realized we left our bass player asleep on the bus. <laughs> There's like this potential <laughs> for the bus to burn down and explode. And everyone's like, hey, did anyone tell Miguel that the bus was on fire? <laughs> Nope. Uh, well, maybe next time we should do that. That speaks yeah. to his uh, something about him that he just kept sleeping yeah. amidst the commotion. <laughs> yeah, those things would happen all the time. Um, that was just like when you had a day without any sort of vehicle incident, it was like, wow, good day. The show could have sucked, but hey, the vehicle, no butt tires, no fires, no transmission outages, no Success. wrecks success so anyway all right well 
We hope you enjoyed this episode. It was more of a lighthearted episode. It was fun. Um, and we hope that uh, you know you're not alone out there. When you have those tough things happen out on the road, it's a part of every artist's career. Even big artists in their fancy buses break down on the side of the road mm -hmm. and get stuck doing all sorts of weird stuff. Um, it's all a part of the experience. <laughs> and even when it's not Halloween, you can always call our listener line with your horror yep, stories. There you go. There you go. All right, Chris. Well, I think that's going to do it. Well, uh, right. have a good have a good trip to Portugal and London. All right. All right. And you enjoy Rhode Island. And we will catch all of you later. Take it easy. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.